I'd like to begin this hearing by stating the Oversight Committee's uh, mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an effect, efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine, genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. appreciate everyone being here this morning. I would like to welcome Ranking Member Tierney and the members of the subcommittee, and members uh, and people that are joining us in the audience and uh, uh, on, on uh, television. The uh, hearing today is progress of the Obama administration's policy towards Iran. Today's proceedings will examine whether the President's strategy is effectively deterring Iran's nuclear program and bringing an end to human rights abuses there. During his campaign for the presidency, President Obama promised the, that his administration would pursue an aggressive strategy to end Iran's nuclear program. In his blueprint for change, he stated that the Obama administration would, quote, use aggressive and direct diplomacy to prevent an Iranian regime from developing a nuclear program. It will put an end to the failed policy that has, that has let Iran develop its nuclear program and strengthen its position in the region and present the Iranian regime with a clear choice. End your nuclear program, support for terror and threats towards Israel, or face increased U.S. and multilateral pressure, end quote. In his inaugural address, President Obama reiterated his preference for open diplomacy and the use of soft power by saying, quote, to those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist, end quote. After a year and a half in office, the administration began applying new pressure to Iran's leadership. In July 2010, President Obama signed into law the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act, also known as CISADA. It expanded the U.S. government's authority to target Iran's energy and financial sectors. It targeted those who commit human rights abuses. To date, the U.S. government has imposed sanctions on 10 companies for violations of this act. Through the sanctions and other, other frameworks, has the United States inflicted economic hardship on Iran? Is this enough? Is that pressure being applied in the right way? If the goal is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, then apparently not. Just last week, the IAEA released a report indicating that Iran has taken actions consistent with the manufacturing of a nuclear weapon. The IAEA report stated the following, quote, the agency has serious concerns regarding possible military dimensions to Iran's nuclear program. After assessing carefully and critically the extensive information available to it, the agency finds the inf information to be overall credible. The information indica indicates that Iran has carried out activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device, end quote. Iran remains undeterred undeterred despite the various sanctions and U.N. Security Council resolutions imposed against it. In fact, Iran's rhetoric is more reckless than ever, especially towards Israel. In sum, the aggressive and direct diplomacy against Iran's nuclear pro program doesn't seem to be working very well. What is the new plan? Is the administration pursuing another strategy? Is it standing behind the current failed approach? I look forward to hearing from our government witness witnesses about whether the administration is revising its approach. A nuclear-armed Iran is an unacceptable outcome for the United States and its allies. Unfortunately, Iran's destructive behavior is not limited to its nuclear program. Over, over the years, they have been known to provide material support to militias in Iraq. Its covert war against the United States is designed to bring instability to Iraq and the region. Fortunately, our military has been a perfect, protective force and has been a significant deterrent. It remains to be seen how many changes how that may change after military withdrawal on uh, military withdrawal on December 31st of this year. Will the State Department be prepared to defeat direct or indirect military action by Iran? Will Secretary Clinton's army of private contractors be able to protect the 16,500 personnel under her care? Look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the extent of the threat and how the administration plans to confront it. Before I recognize the ranking member, I would like to note the absence of senior policymakers from the State Department, the Defense Department, and the Treasury Department. I extended invitations to deputy secretaries of those agencies, but they declined to make times in their schedule and, and appear today. The undersecretaries of those agencies were invited, but they are either busy or away from the office. I find it inexcusable that we continue to be rebuffed by the administration for providing the witnesses most pertinent to these types of hearings. It is imperative that they show up before these hearings, and yet there is a continued pattern here that is just unacceptable 
to the American people and to this, uh, this committee, I, I find it inexcusable. The issues surrounding the Iran, Iran are complex. The solutions are difficult and dynamic. There is no excuse to hide from oversight. Senior policymakers should be here to answer questions about the President's strategy, and taxpayers deserve nothing less than a full accounting for their investment in these programs. I look forward to hearing from our, our witnesses. I will also add, it was our initial request to have the members uh, all appear on one panel so we could have a candid discussion. It would be a better use of members' time and, I think, a better discussion for the American people. The administration refused to sit next to people who weren't in the government, and so consequently, uh, they, they have elected to be on a separate panel. We'll hear from them after on panel number two. I now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank all of our witnesses for being here today. We appreciate the uh, advice and insight that you will provide for the committee. You know, the United States obviously has a difficult relationship with Iran, and it has uh, faced some significant new strains in that relationship just in the past month. On October 11, 2011, the Department of Justice indicted an Iranian-American for allegedly attempting to orchestrate the assassination of a Saudi ambassador to the United States on American soil. Just last week, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, released a report making the case that over the past 10 years, and I quote, Iran has carried out activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device, close quote. How we respond to such threats to our national interests, the security of Israel, and the stability of the Middle East is a major question. Some have called on the United States to punish Iran through harsher sanctions. I do want to point out that you know, President Obama made uh, comments during his election that he would make efforts to reach out to the Iranian people and their government to try to uh, work out uh, some uh, solution to the problems that existed there. He made extraordinary efforts to reach out. Uh, they were rebuffed, and I think the only good thing that came of that, obviously, was that the rest of the international community understood that this President was at least making a good faith effort, and this country was making a good faith effort, and that international community, and with our allies, uh, have worked with the President to put in more effective uh, sanctions since that point in time than any previous administration has put in place. So I agree that we have to continue the pressure on, on Iran's leaders, and we have to uh, get them to comply with their treaty obligations, and we also have to be sure to weigh all the consequences of those sanctions. These are serious matters. International sanctions should be narrowly focused to inflict maximum pain on the ruling regime in Tehran while minimizing the impact of the people of Iran and on global markets. For example, many have suggested increased sanctions on Iran's oil industry. Although this is an obvious target given that oil counts for 80 percent of Iran's exports and 70 percent of the government's revenue, any sanctions would likely lead to a significant increase in global oil prices. We have to weigh that and determine whether or not that means we should move forward those sanctions or take some other course. Given our current economic conditions, any significant increase in oil prices is likely to harm any fragile recovery in the world and increase living expenses for families uh, both in Europe and Asia as well as the United States. I have also been concerned by recent attempts by Congress to tie the hands of the administration by mandating sanctions of a particular nature without leaving suitable flexibility. Although I believe Congress has an important role to play in authorizing executive action and determining the scope of potential sanctions, I think that Congress must also provide the President with the authority to exercise sanctions and the flexibility to determine when and how to use them in conjunction with international partners. Only with this flexibility will the President be able to continue to ensure the support of the international community and ultimately facilitate a change in Iranian policies, we hope. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today. I hope they can help us explore our options at this critical point in American-Iranian relations. As we discuss these options, we must carefully evaluate all of the risk and all of the potential benefits of each policy option and ensure an effective approach. I want to thank you again, all of our witnesses. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. Now, I'd like thank you. I'd like, now like to recognize uh, the Chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, this dis distinguished member from California, Mr. Ice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will be brief. Uh, I came here to, to show solidarity over the, your concern that the administration continues to rebuff any attempt at real oversight by this and other committees of the Congress. I, I could not fail to note uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts' opening statement that somehow there is a price of oil linked to whether or not we have effective uh, enforcement uh, against Iran. The gentleman will yield. Of course. That was a question about whether or not there ought to be and whether or not we ought to consider it. Right. So I don't mind you quoting me. Just please do it accurately. And uh, in light of that uh, full, full disclosure, I think it is only fair that 
we understand that this committee has, uh, in other subcommittees, worked very hard to recognize what the potential for replacement of Saudi Arabia, Iranian, and other oil and natural gas. We are now becoming a net exporter of natural gas, and Pennsylvania alone has more proven known reserves of oil than Iran could possibly export. The fact is we can, in fact, become oil and natural gas self-sufficient and even become an exporter, as we are, of natural gas. So I do believe that we should go to the basic question. The basic question before us today is not what is Iran's intentions. I was a first lieutenant in 1979. I have lived through Iran's intentions for longer than most people in this room have been alive. It is very, very clear that Iran's intentions are to continue being a disruptive force to peace and security in a region in which they live and extend it well beyond. The only exception that I would make is for those who say that what they might do miss the point that every day Lebanon is held captive by a Hezbollah financed by Iran. Every day the Palestinian people find themselves having those who do not support peace and coexistence with Israel financed by Iran. Every day the Syrian regime is kept together by money from Iran. And that is only the tip of the iceberg. As the uh, uh, chairman note, noted and the ranking member noted, the attempt to assassinate a seated ambassador from Saudi Arabia on U.S. soil is another uh, example of an Iranian connection that is ongoing. So as we look today at what Iran will do with a nuclear weapon, I would suggest strongly that this committee recognize Iran will do with a nuclear weapon, even if it never uses it, everything it has done for more than three decades and more. A nuclear weapon gives impunity to a government to be taken by force, something that Iran has not had to face. Iran has had to look at the existential threat of going to war with one or more other nations. Once they have a nuclear weapon, they simply will do more of what they have been doing. They will fund terrorism around the world. They will be, in fact, a greater threat to Israel than they are today. I find that sometimes hard to believe, but I believe that they simply will look and say, now we can arm in a higher way Hezbollah and Hamas. So the, economic, the attempts to limit the economic capability of Iran to fund that are woefully inadequate. I do reserve the right and the authority of Congress to dictate to the President what he or she can do with taxpayer dollars. And I think it is extremely important that the American people understand that as long as we allow one dollar to be exported to Hamas or Hezbollah or other terrorist organizations by Iran, we have not done all we can do to limit the scope of their terrorism around the world. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record, and I would like to recognize our, our first uh, panel. Mr. Mark D uh, Dubowitz is the Executive Director of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Mr. Dr. Kenneth Pollock is the Director of the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. And Dr. Suzanne Maloney is the Senior Fellow at the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. We appreciate you all being here and taking time in preparation for this uh, hearing. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify. If you will please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be part of the record, and then we will move to questioning. We will now uh, recognize Mr. Dubowitz uh, for five minutes. Great. Well, thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Turney, and Chairman Issa, for the honor of testifying before you today. Now, many rightly question the effectiveness of economic sanctions as the primary tool to frustrate or even thwart Tehran's nuclear plans. Sanctions, indeed, have led to the slow-motion demise of the Iranian energy industry, as Iranian oil production continues to materially decline. However, their medium to long-term impact is insufficient because Iran will likely cross the nuclear threshold before these sanctions have time to work. There is also no evidence yet to suggest that economic pressure has made the Iranian regime rethink its decisions to develop nuclear weapons. U.S. sanctions policy has been crafted in a way that reduces Iranian oil investment while giving the market time to adjust to a reduction in Iranian production. 
The downside of this medium-term sanction strategy is continued near-term annual export revenue of approximately $80 billion. These funds provide sufficient resources to buttress the regime against sanctions and its economic and political challenges and to fund its nuclear and other nefarious activities. To have any chance of success, sanctions need to target Iran's oil sales, which account for up to 75 percent of the government budget, 80 percent of export earnings, and they need to do this without causing a significant increase in petroleum prices. Otherwise, Tehran can sell less and make more money. But effective energy sanctions don't have to raise oil prices. They actually can do the opposite if Washington learns how to leverage the self-interest of companies that won't adhere to U.S. sanctions. The objective of sanctions targeting Iran's oil sales ought to be to discourage white-hatted companies, European and some Asian companies that have no desire to risk their access to the American market from dealing in Iranian oil, while allowing black-hatted companies, mainly Chinese firms and some others, to continue to buy Iranian crude in whatever quantity they desire. We should want to reduce the number of potential buyers of Iranian petroleum without reducing the quantity of oil on the market. With enough white-hatted companies out of the market, black-hatted companies can drive ruthlessly for price discounts from Tehran. The Chinese in particular are aggressive businessmen with an interest in secure and cheap oil. I recommend the following three policies to accomplish this goal. Number one, sanction companies buying oil from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. The Obama administration can greatly intensify the hassle factor in buying Iranian crude by designating IRGC entities in the crude oil supply chain, including the National Iranian Oil Company. Number two, establishing the United States as an Iranian oil-free zone. Right now, there is a loophole in U.S. law. American consumers are filling up their gasoline tanks with refined petroleum made from Iranian crude oil. The Iranian oil-free zone would close this loophole by requiring that all European refineries exporting refined petroleum to the United States must certify that those products do not contain Iranian oil and be subject to penalties for false certification. We have done detailed economic modeling that indicates an Iranian oil-free zone would have a negligible impact on the price of oil and gasoline, but deny the regime between $2.8 billion and $39 billion in annual oil revenues. Even at the lowest end of this range, this adds an additional 20 percent to Treasury Department estimates that all sanctions will cost Iran $14 billion in annual oil revenues over the next five years. Number three, targeting the Central Bank of Iran. The administration should designate the CBI in its entirety, but provide at least six months before implementation begins in order to give oil companies time to find alternative suppliers and calm oil markets. This will be a critical six-month period, however. In order to take advantage of this period, Washington should immediately and selectively prohibit certain oil transactions where the CBI plays a role in involving IRGC-affiliated companies and oil buyers. Sanctions need not be enforced against Chinese energy firms buying Iranian oil. Treasury will have more flexibility to selectively enforce against some buyers and not others based on evidence of IRGC involvement. Energy traders will quickly sense that the quantity of oil in the market remains unchanged while Iran watches its oil revenues decline. This avoids price spikes as oil trades will continue. Only the number of buyers for Iranian oil will be reduced. This approach will be very costly for the CBI. It would reinforce an important message as well. The CBI is a critical link in the IRGC-dominated oil supply chain and a key enabler of IRGC activities. This will help Washington build international support for blanket designation of the CBI, give markets more time to adjust to the possibility of more severe sanctions, and persuade oil purchasers and financial institutions to assess carefully the risks of doing business with the central bank. These three approaches are mutually reinforcing and designed to achieve one goal, shrink the pool of buyers for Iranian crude and give the remaining buyers enough negotiating power to extract significant discounts from Tehran. If oil sanctions fail, no one could argue that countries threatened by Iran did not exhaust all peaceful alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. And an impressive two seconds left on the clock. Dr. Pollack, my challenge to you is to we, – we appreciate your testimony. We will now recognize you for five minutes. If you can – microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Tierney, Congressman Cummings. Uh, it is a great pleasure to address the subcommittee on this incredibly important topic. Uh, although I am ready and willing to discuss the totality of U.S. policy toward Iran and Iranian policy toward the United States as we understand it, I would like to focus my remarks on Iran's role in Iraq, especially in the wake of the mutual decision by the United States and the government of Iraq to end the American military mission to Iraq at the end of this year. For now, 
I would simply like to make three main points about this extremely important topic, a topic that will have profound influence on Iraq itself, on American policy toward Iraq, and on the wider U.S.-Iranian competition throughout the Middle East. The first point is that Iranian influence in Iraq is largely determined by how confident and strong the Iraqis feel, principally with regard to their own internal politics. Ambassador Ryan Crocker, when he was ambassador to Iraq, used to remark that there is a natural limit on Iran's influence in Iraq. This is a true statement, but it is also a relative statement. It is not an absolute. The ability of the Iraqis to resist Iran is heavily dependent on their own sense of self-confidence, the strength that they feel in themselves, and the strength of their own political process moving forward. Uh, to use an analogy from the Cold War, I think that it is safe to say that there was a natural limit on Russian influence in Finland that was no less great than a, the limit on Iranian influence in Iraq. But when the Finns felt that there was no one who could come to their defense after the Second World War, they unfortunately allowed the, the Soviets to dictate their foreign policy. Again, this was simply a function of the inability of the Finns to push back, of their sense that there was no one who could help them do so. We have seen the same thing in Iraq. When Iraqis have been strong, when they have been confident in 2003 and 2004, Iranian influence has been extremely limited. This was perhaps no greater than in 2008 to 2010, the period after the American surge and Iraq's own Operation Charge of the Nights, in which Iranian forces were largely routed from Iraq. Jaysh al-Mahdi and other Iranian-backed uh, insurgencies and militias in Iraq were driven from the country in a series of operations from Basra to Sadr City. The Iraqi people stepped out, demonstrated that they wanted nothing to do with Iran, and as a result, Iranian influence was greatly limited. In contrast, Iran's influence was greatest in the period 2005-2006 when Iran, Iraq was de descending into civil war and was able to pry apart the many divisions within Iraq to play different Iraqi groups off against one another and use the influence that it has most of. Weapons, intelligence, violence, money, all of the things that Iraqis needed in that period of time. My second point is that Iran is now, unfortunately, stronger than it has ever been in Iraq before. And its influence, unfortunately, is likely to increase rather than decrease after the American withdrawal. Iraq's 2010 elections were in and of themselves very good elections, but the aftermath was very poor. They have led to the formation of a national unity government in Iraq that is deeply paralyzed, that is riven by its own divisions, and this has allowed the Iranians to once again pry apart Iraq, isolate different groups, make inroads with a variety. Ultimately, it was Iran that put together this government in Iraq, not the United States. In speaking to senior Iraqi leaders in recent months, I am struck by how many of them have said, mostly in resignation, never with any sense of joy, that today no Iraqi can become prime minister without Iranian approval. Ultimately, Iran is the chief backer of violent extremist groups like Asayib al haq Khateb Hezbollah, who are running rampant in southern Iraq, who are recreating the violence there. They are the patrons of the Sudras. They have exerted tremendous influence on a variety of Kurdish groups and others in Iraq. And ultimately, Iran is now becoming the dominant external force in Iraqi politics. My third and final point is that the best way that the United States can help remedy this current situation is, and it should follow from my previous two, by strengthening Iraqi domestic politics. Unfortunately, our ability to do so has been greatly limited. The withdrawal of American troops from Iraq will be a tremendous limitation on American influence moving forward. Ideally, the United States would massively ramp up its aid to Iraq in the wake of the withdrawal of American forces, but in the current budgetary climate, this seems unlikely. Moreover, the White House has signaled a desire to pull back from the Middle East, not to move forward. This certainly is the perception in the region. Ultimately, the most useful thing that the United States could do would be to find it in its heart to provide some assistance to Iraq. The more that Iraqis feel that the United States is helping them, guiding their politics, the stronger they will feel they will push back on Iraq, excuse me, on Iran. And what we have seen is that they are far more able to push back on Iran and to prevent Iran from exerting influence in Iraqi affairs than we ever are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Maloney, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Chaffetz, Representative Tierney, 
and the entire subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss this very important issue of U.S. policy toward Iran. I am going to focus my remarks on the central question of today's hearing, and that is the track record of the current administration and addressing the challenges posed by Tehran. I will tell you that I see a sort of a good news, bad news story, and so I will talk a little bit about both the elements of success and the elements uh, where we could need tremendous improvement and talk about a few principles that one might consider in moving forward in terms of looking at policy toward Tehran. It is notable that the Obama administration has come full circle from a tentative embrace of diplomacy and engagement to a much more robust and effective international effort to pressure Tehran than has ever existed. This transformation is, in fact, quite <coughs> typical. Every administration since that of President Carter, since the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, has used a variety of, of, of tactics and implements. Uh, at its disposal, everything from diplomacy to sanctions under every single administration from both parties. The good news is that the Obama administration has really achieved unprecedented success. We have seen uh, the assembling of the widest and deepest international coalition of countries to deal with the threat of Iran. And I think what we've seen, particularly since 2010, is a real sense of momentum that the international community has come together, that there's a real partnership, not simply between the U.S. and Europe, but also between the U.S. and Russia and other countries as well, with China playing effectively a sort of non-confrontational, more passive role with respect to sanctions. I think that it's important to recognize, despite the fact that we have not yet achieved our objectives with respect to changing Iranian policy, that assembling this kind of a coalition is no small achievement. Never before in the history of the Islamic Republic, despite 32 years of egregious policies and offenses against both its own people and its neighbors, as well as U.S. interests in the region, never before have we seen the willingness of the international community to jeopardize its economic relationships with the Islamic Republic in anywhere near the degree that we have today. Day. And we know that these sanctions are having an impact on Iran. The Iranians themselves, from the supreme leader on down, are saying so in a very public fashion, and they're taking actions to deal with it. That, of course, is the bad news, that the sanctions have imposed a financial, heavy financial and political costs, but they haven't yet convinced Iranian leaders to change their policies, to relinquish their nuclear ambitions and abandon their other reckless policies, or to engage in a really serious dialogue with Washington. There are a variety of reasons why this is the case. The political climate within Tehran, where we've seen the elevation of a group of policymakers who in fact see sanctions as part of an international conspiracy and who believe in fact there's an existential demand on the regime to resist these sanctions. They're less prone than ever to bending under economic pressure or accepting the cost-benefit logic of sanctions. And the Iranians also have tremendous capacity and a long history of working to mitigate and subvert sanctions. They're also quite adept at encouraging sanctions busting. And they've done quite a bit to exploit the disparity that exists in the international sanctions regime, whereby com companies from countries such as China, which adhere to the bare minimum of UN Security Council sanctions but have yet to enact their own individual unilateral sanctions on energy investment in Iran, effectively have free reign to continue to invest in Iran today. So as a result, I think that the difficulty that we face is sanctions are not going to have the impact that we want, that the kind of dual-track, carrot-and-stick effort to bring Iran to the negotiating table is less likely to work today than ever before. For that reason, let me lay out five principles very quickly that I think are essential to moving forward as we reassess U.S. policy at a time where it is, uh, I think, a very opportune moment for doing so. First, we must have multilateral cooperation. That is what has made such an important psychological and economic impact over the past two years since the uh, latest U.N. sanctions, U.N. Security Council sanctions, and unilateral measures by a variety of countries. It's incredibly important in doing so that we bring and keep China on board in a much more robust way than we have to date. That China plays the indispensable role in terms of shaping the Iranian future. Second, we have to acknowledge and we have to articulate publicly both to the American public and to our allies and partners abroad that tough measures will entail tough trade-offs. There's a lot of talk about crippling sanctions, but there's uh, too often, I think, a, an optimistic presumption that, we can, that those sanctions would have negligible impact on uh, the, the very economic parameters of the U.S. market or of the international market. Oil markets are worldwide. Oil supply is fungible. As a result, anything we do to impact Iran's ability to export its crude will have an imp impact on the price of oil here at home. 
Third, we should never unilaterally take diplomacy off the table. Every administration has used diplomacy and every future administration will. Measures that tie any administration's hand are irresponsible and counterproductive. Fourth, the invocation of threats does little to advance our interests with respect to Iran. It, in fact, empowers the very people who we're looking to disempower in Iran. Finally, we need to rethink the universe of possibilities for advancing political change within Iran. And to do so, we need to have a conversation that goes beyond the standard uh, discussion around the discredited terrorist organization, the Mojahideen al khalq With that, I cede the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know you all had uh, much more to say, but I appreciate uh, the concise nature. And five minutes is difficult with such a broad and complex issue such as this. I am now going to recognize myself for five minutes, and then we will have other uh, members uh, proceed with the questioning. Uh, and I, Dr. Maloney, I, I really appreciate the comments you made. I think I agreed with a lot of your points. To suggest that there has been, in your words, unprecedented success, um, I, I just I, I beg to understand, or I just don't understand where you think there's been unprecedented success, other than, you know, maybe getting some European countries to say, "Hey, we support you." I mean, even in, when we list the five key points, one of the uh, critical nature you mentioned, China. China is not coming along. China has not been helpful and persuasive in this. Do you see any sense that China, being such a pivotal role in, in close proximity, obviously, to Iran? that they are in any way, shape, or form helping us in, in any way? Yes. I think, first, that the U.N. Sanctions Resolution 1929, which was approved in June 2010, was, in fact, much more robust and much more meaningful. It includes a conventional arms ban. It included measures that facilitated European Union sanctions that effectively preclude any European investment in the Iranian energy sector. That is unprecedented. It is important. It has a real impact, both economically and psychologically. The Iranians would much prefer to deal with European companies, ultimately. In terms of Chinese cooperation, I think, in fact, we have seen quite a bit. They uh, were cooperative during the process of the negotiation of UN Security Council Resolution 1929. They have gone slow with their investment. They have refused to sign new deals with Iran. But they do continue to do business. They are not legally prohibited from doing so. And that is, I think, where all the upside potential is in dealing with Iran, in, in making the point that the international community is united. It is very, very important that we persuade the Chinese to go beyond the current UN Security Council sanctions measures. Thank, thank you. I and I guess my concern is I don't think that we've uh, we've been doing this, uh, Mr. Dubowitz. Let me, let me go to you. In your testimony, you list 18 firms connected to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, uh, which form part of the crude oil supply chain. These firms' activities were detailed in a report from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies to the administration back in February. To the best of your knowledge, has the administration taken any action against the 18 firms noted in that report? You are starting to see some action. They, they sanctioned Tidewater, which is the largest ports operator in Iran. I think that is uh, important. It is consequential. But there are literally hundreds of IRGC firms that are dominant players in the, in the oil supply chain, including the largest Iranian energy front company in the world, the National Iranian Oil Company, NIOC, which is presented as a state-owned institution and is usually the counterparty on an oil trade. But the IRGC is a dominant player in the Iranian energy industry, including in, in NIOC. And so I think that the administration should move ahead and sanction NIOC and other IRGC players in the oil supply chain and send a message to what I call white-hatted companies, those who have U.S. interests, who care about their reputation, who don't want a front-page story in the Financial Times that they are doing business with the Revolutionary Guard Corps, and send a message that if you are buying oil from Iran, you are buying it from the Revolutionary Guard Corps, and that is bad for business. It is bad for your exposure. It is bad for your reputation. We could rapidly accelerate the pace of designations. The administration could do much more and do it very quickly. And in doing so, send a message that we will not impact supply of oil, but we will go after price. We will put the remaining buyers, including the Chinese buyers, in a position where they will have strong negotiating leverage to force a discount on the price of oil without taking one barrel of Iranian oil off the market. I, I agree with Dr. Maloney. We shouldn't be going after physical supply. We shouldn't be spooking oil markets. We shouldn't be doing anything that sends a message that we will be taking 2.3 million barrels of Iranian oil off the market. But put the remaining buyers in a stronger negotiating position. I have a lot of confidence in Chinese oil traders that they will drive ruthlessly for price discounts if they have the Iranians figuratively and literally over a barrel. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Or Dr. Pollock, let's talk about uh, what is going to happen at the end of the year uh, in the concerns that the Iranians will redirect uh, the, many of their tax. You know, we got 16,500 people that will be left there uh, starting January 1st, uh, many of these contractors. Uh, let's talk a little bit more, if you will, about the uh, ramifications, what you see Iran doing there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a critical question moving forward. Uh, having spent quite a bit of time in Iraq and been rocketed, been mortared, um, this is not something to take lightly. Muqtada Asadr has already announced that the American Embassy should be considered a residual occupying force and should be resisted as staunchly as the American troop presence was. Uh, what we have seen is a growth in, Iran in Iranian backed capabilities among groups like Aseba Hal al Haq, Kateb Hezbollah, the Promised Day Brigades. And what we have seen is very little willingness on the part of the Iraqi government to actually crack down on these because of its own complicated internal politics. I don't see any of that changing moving forward except that our ability both to influence the Iraqi government to get the things they need to do is going to be dramatically diminished. It took intervention by the administration and in particular General Austin to get the Iraqis to do anything over the summer, and even that has tapered off since then. And what's more, our ability to respond directly is going to be dramatically undermined. Uh, no matter how many uh, Black Hawk helicopters, triple canopy may have, they are not going to have the same capability that the Apaches that our current forces have. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. We will now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. And, you know, with uh, your deference, Mr. Chairman, I am going to defer to the, uh, the ranking member of the oh. full committee. I think it is scheduled. Uh, Absolutely. We, rather than do that, we will recognize the, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Maloney, in your written statement, you say that the, there is simply no mechanism for exerting game-changing pressure on Iran without imposing unpredictable and probably unpleasant consequences for the global energy balance and the worldwide economic recovery. Dr. Maloney, what do you think of Mr. Dubowitz's uh, claim that his approach to tougher sanctions on Iran's oil sales does not risk driving up the price of oil? I haven't investigated the modeling that he has uh, compiled, but what I have seen and read of uh, the mechanism that he proposes is that uh, many experts on oil markets suggest that it would have an escalatory impact on the price of oil both here and around the world. And, Dr. Maloney, do you think that significant uh, new sanctions on Iran's uh, oil sales are worth the risks of endangering the global economic recovery? I think we have yet to see that this regime in Tehran is susceptible to economic pressure in terms of changing its foreign policy. I was testifying before the subcommittee two years ago, and people said that refined petroleum products cutting off supply of gasoline to Tehran would be an Achilles heel and change its posture. We did not see that, in fact, occur. I am not optimistic that incremental measures, even if they make Iran's fiscal conditions more difficult, will alter their approach to their security policy. So you just think they are they're hard nosed? I think that this regime and this current leadership in Tehran is uh, tied to its approach to the world, is deeply paranoid and defensive, looking at the regional environment, looking at what's happened in Libya. They are unlikely to bargain away their nuclear advantage or any of their other policies. They see these as existential defense mechanisms against a world which is aligned against them. Now, the Obama administration can make a persuasive claim to unprecedented successes in dealing with Iran, and yet the ultimate objective of United States policy, eliminating the threats posed by the regime's pursuit of nuclear capability, support for terrorism and abuse of its own citizenry, remains as distant as ever. Dr. Malani, Malani do you believe that further economic sanctions are necessary for the United States to make progress in achieving this, this goal? I think sanctions, which bring the entire world together to send a message to Tehran, will have an impact over time. But I think we also have to recognize that they also have an impact on our own economy. 
Iran is capable of change, but the level of, of impact that we need to have is one that will involve the entire international community coming together in a united fashion. And speaking of that international community, I think you said that the, um, the fact that all of these nations have come together with regard to this effort is unprecedented. Do you see any threat to that cohesion? I think as sanctions endure and the fact that the Chinese can continue to do business in Iran, even if they have been relatively cooperative to date in terms of not expanding their posture in Iran since the 2010 UN Security Council resolution, that will encourage other countries and companies to sanctions bust. In particular, I would look toward Russia, which is also not uh, susceptible to other sanctions at the moment. The leadership is not inclined to accept them, and they have no unilateral uh, sanctions which preclude their energy companies from investing in Iran's energy sector. I would suspect that over time, as China continues to do business in Iran, the Russians will look to expand their own position there. Well, would unilateral sanctions by the United States undermine the progress that was made in convincing the international community to participate in a comprehensive sanctions uh, regime? Sanctions that make the price of oil more expensive for customers of Iranian crude will alienate those customers, in particular China and India. Right. And therefore? And therefore, they will make it much more difficult for us to attain the level of international cooperation that is necessary to drive a, a decisive message to Tehran. Well, in wake of the assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States and the recent report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, some have called on Congress to pass strict sanctions against and to limit diplomatic communications with Iran. Mr. Dubowitz, do you believe Congress should pass strict sanctions uh, legislation that eliminates the administration's ability to apply sanctions uh, when needed and prevents further attempts um, at diplomacy? Well, Ranking Member Connings, I am very much focused on whether sanctions can actually work, whether the United States should be talking to the Iranians and what they should be talking about is, is up to the administration. I mean, I, what I want to do is respond to the point about sanctions. I, I ultimately do not think sanctions will force the Iranian regime to change its risk-reward calculus with respect to a nuclear weapon. Let me be clear and on the record on that. I do think that we have a moral and strategic responsibility to try and to exhaust all peaceful alternatives. Otherwise, perhaps everybody on this panel will agree we may have to move to more coercive methods. What I want to suggest with respect to oil sales is that there is a way to do this. Instead of only punishing greed, our sanctions regime is always designed to punish greed, to punish the self-interest of companies that want to continue to do business with Iran. What I am suggesting is that there may be an opportunity to leverage greed, in other words, to shrink the number of buyers for Iranian oil using a variety of methods, both unilateral and multilateral, designed to actually put the Chinese and others in a position where they can buy all the oil they want from Iran, but they have stronger negotiating leverage because the pool of potential buyers of Iranian oil sh is shrunk. And we can do that through a variety of ways that have already been used multilaterally. For example, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the idea of designating IRGC companies that are active in the Iranian economy is something that has received overwhelming international support from the U.N., from the E.U., the United States, Canada, Japan, South Korea. In fact, former Under Secretary Stuart Levy, his uh, successor, Under Secretary David Cohen, are using exactly this method to persuade international financial institutions to stop doing business with IRGC banks. I am suggesting we do the same thing in the crude oil supply chain, designate IRGC entities, and then threaten sanctions against companies that do business with the IRGC. The reality is white-hatted companies. Europeans, Japanese, some South Korean refineries will respond to that pressure. The Chinese and others will not. But that is fine. Let them continue buying Iranian oil. Let them drive for price discounts. Let them not impact physical supply. If, you, if Congress and the administration is too aggressive in calling for sanctions against physical supply, then I agree with Dr. Maloney. What you are going to see is a spike in oil prices. But if we make the case that this is about price, not about supply, I think we can have a much better alternative. And if, we, if it doesn't work, no one could argue that countries threatened by Iran have not exhausted all peaceful alternatives. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pollack, the, uh, President Bush made, entered a deal or arrangement contract with um, Iraq 
uh, Governor, that we would have our troops out at the end of 2011. And uh, President Obama has been trying to fulfill that commitment, I, I believe. So given that background, that you know, the President Bush agreement to get the troops out by that point and our, uh, the Iraqis' apparent unwillingness to amend that in any sense of the way, am I hearing that your response to this is, at this point, uh, the best that we can do in terms of that is to try and uh, give some useful and robust assistance from the United States uh, to Iraq to try to help them resolve their internal problems and strengthen their government and their ability to withstand uh, pressures from Iran? I think you have to put your microphone on, please. Thank you, Franny. Thank you. First, Congressman, I would certainly agree that there have been a long, painful litany of mistakes made in uh, American policy toward Iraq, and they begin from the very early days of the Bush administration's focus on Iraq. Uh, it is certainly the case that the, the hand left to the Obama administration was a weak one. Uh, nevertheless, I think that we've made, uh, we've created additional problems for ourselves since then. There's no question that we are where we are. It, there is no question that Iran's influence in Iraq has increased and will likely increase as our troops withdraw. The best that we can hope for is to help moderate Iranian behavior, and the best way to do that is to strengthen Iraq's own internal politics. That is going to be difficult in an era of declining American resource commitment to Iraq, and therefore we have to act as creatively as we possibly can. Uh, much of what I have proposed, much of what is in my written testimony is about how we find creative ways to do that, uh, to do things by giving things other than just money know-how, diplomatic assistance, but one that is also worth thinking about because actually the Iraqis will likely have the ability to buy it at some point in time is military assistance, which the Iraqis need and, as we have seen in Egypt, can play an extremely important role in helping shape Iraq's political development, which, as I have stressed, is the key to keeping Iran out. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Dubowitz, now I am going to call on your integrity to help us out here. We don't have a witness up here who can uh, apparently counteract your theory. You know from uh, having you put your position out there that other people have rebutted it in some sense. So I'm, I'm sure you are fully aware of that. Do us the favor, if you would, of presenting what those uh, rebuttals are, you know, what issues do people raise with your argument, and then again I will offer you the chance to rebut them back and, and give your position again. But I am curious to know what people say when you say this is a way to do it, how do they couch the way that they think it is going to drive up international prices and, and why? Is it because that oil is fungible uh, on the market? Is it because they, they just think that China will come in and buy up the 2.3? Uh, billion and, and it won't be any big deal, uh, if you would. Yeah, no, there, there are certainly some weaknesses to the argument. I think the first is that the assumption is that the Chinese will actually use their trade negotiating leverage to force a discount. The Chinese may have other strategic objectives and they decide they are going to pay a premium for oil in order to support the Iranian regime and undermine American security. I think that is perhaps one weakness. I think a second weakness of, of the argument is that it, it presupposes that our short-term sanctions policy is to stop this Iranian nuclear weapon. If you believe that our sanctions policy should be designed as a containment strategy, then a medium to long-term sanction strategy is sufficient. And I think that the administration has done a good job of putting in place a medium to long-term sanctions regime, and I think Dr. Maloney articulated what that looks like. Unfortunately, I think we should stop the nuclear bomb. I think President Obama has made it very clear that Iranian nuclear weapon is unacceptable. And I fear that we are in a bit of a sanctions sleepwalk where we have done a very good job, where the administration has done a very good job of designing a regime that has decreased foreign investment in the Iranian energy sector, that has shrunk gasoline imports by about 90 percent, that has led to many companies terminating their business ties, including providing technology to Iran's massive natural gas industry. And so the medium to long-term sanction strategy is working. It has gone after investment, it is shrinking oil production, and I think in that respect it is giving energy markets time to adjust so that there isn't a reactionary or alarmist response to the sanctions. Part of the weakness of the argument is if you are pursuing a short-term strategy, it is not 100 percent clear how energy markets will respond. And I think that it is up to the administration and Congress when speaking about this to speak about oil sanctions responsibly. And to make it very clear to energy markets, the goal is not to go after physical supply, but in fact to keep every barrel of Iranian oil on the market, but at a discounted price. So it is really a question of short-term to long-term strategy. I fear, again, that we are in a bit of a sanction sleepwalk where we all recite positive talking points about how sanctions are working, but I think we are all beginning to acknowledge that sanctions have not worked. So it appears that, once again, under your proposal, China would hold the key again, depending on whether or not we could convince China to, to not pay a premium. 
uh, whether or not they would found out that their goal was to sort of give it to us by just paying the premium and watch the prices go up and watch the West country sort of figure out how they are going to deal with that in the middle of an economic problem, or uh, they are going to just have their own self-interest in mind on economics. It is both self-interest, I guess, right. to pick one over the other. Is that fair to say? Well, I think it is fair to say. I mean, it may be that the Chinese actually don't want to see a nuclear-armed Iran. It may not be good for, for Chinese energy and national security. So it may be an opportunity for them to actually support both their economic self-interest and their political self-interest. But I think that is an open question. So it would be useful for us to get some Chinese experts in here to explore that further about what their reaction may be. I, I think certainly from a, uh, a political economy perspective, in terms of their strategic objectives, I think mm -hmm. it is very useful Thank to you. have Chinese experts who can elucidate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry I was in another committee meeting. I, I understand you touched on the issue of the Central Bank of Iran. Um, I would just reference the letter from the 92 Senators to Senator Obama urging him to sanction the Central Bank and Mr. Geithner's response, which was, quote, all options to increase the financial pressure on Iran are on the table, including the possibility of imposing additional sanctions against the CBI. Is there a timetable for, for doing this? And um, um, have we discussed this possibility with our allies? I believe those discussions are taking place right now. Uh, there are amendments that have been offered in both the House and the Senate to include a CBI designation in the current legislation. I think there is certainly a lot of discussion about how to do this. I absolutely support a blanket designation of the CBI. I think it needs to be done in a way, however, that is targeted incremental and, rapid, and implemented rapidly. In other words, if you today call for a blanket designation with a view that you are going to strictly enforce that designation, thereby essentially cutting off the possibility that people buying Iranian oil can use the CBI to settle those oil transactions, you may be sending a message to the markets that there is no way to financially settle an oil trade. On the other hand, if today the administration were to target the CBI to make the, this, this very case if you are buying Iranian oil, you are buying it from the Revolutionary Guard Corps, and if you are settling that transaction with the CBI, then we will sanction that transaction. That is a selective, targeted way of doing it. And again, it, it builds into this theory that there will be some oil buyers who will respond to that pressure and will look for alternative suppliers. There will be other oil buyers who will s believe the administration will never sanction them and will continue settling those transactions through the CBI. I think we, if we did that, number one, we could move today targeting the CBI instead of waiting for a blanket designation. Number two, we could lay the predicate for a, a much tougher CBI designation down the road. And number three, I do think we need to give time to markets for markets to adjust to a CBI designation. Again, there are major buyers of Iranian oil using the CBI because the U.S. Treasury Department has done such an effective job of shutting down other financial avenues to settle an oil transaction. Again, incremental steps implemented rapidly with a view to minimize the opportunity or the, the risk of a reactionary or alarmist response from oil markets. The reaction from the other doctors? I, I think it is simply just a fallacy that you can begin to reduce the, the opportunities for companies to purchase crude coming out of Iran and it will have no impact on the, on the price of oil anywhere else. It is, you know, if it increases the leverage of Chinese companies to drive other competitors from the market for purchasing Iranian crude, then it will thereby decrease the leverage of those other companies, which are no longer then available to as purchasers of Iranian crude as they deal with other countries and companies. Right now, in fact, what we see is that the Iranians are, in fact, gaining advantage. When the, Greece, when the Greeks have had difficulty making purchases elsewhere, they have turned to the Iranians. This sort of um, idea that somehow the Iranians can become a kind of niche market for only bad countries and bad companies to purchase crude oil from simply doesn't reflect the realities of the international marketplace. And the idea that somehow we can inspect every barrel of crude that comes into this country to ensure that not a drop of oil was produced in Iran is you know, simply inconsistent with the way the international oil market works. Doctor. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I would like to take this to a slightly higher level and say you know, what I think we have all been saying is that it is a mistake to believe that sanctions alone are going to achieve our goals with Iran. I completely agree with my colleague Dr. Mullane's statement. 
The sanctions have had an unprecedented impact, and yet they are not achieving our goal, and we should not assume that they will. Uh, by the same token, it would be a mistake to scale back the sanctions. That would send absolutely the wrong message to Iran, to the Iranian people, to the rest of the international community, to other would-be proliferators. I think that the real question is, first, can we in some way find ways to help do a little bit more with sanctions, because we do want to keep the pressure on, but in particular, how do we find other ways to bring pressure against Iran on issues that this regime actually believes important to it? The sanctions have not been able to accomplish that. And I would urge this subcommittee to hold additional hearings on other ways that the United States might bring pressure on Iran on other areas beyond its economy, which, again, are not unimportant. They are important, but they clearly are not going to get us to where we want to be. Mr. Nubus. Yeah, if I could follow on what Dr. Pollack said, I think that is absolutely right. I mean, we talk about sanctions, we talk about economic sanctions. I think human rights sanctions have actually played a very important consequential role, particularly in focusing world attention on the vast system of oppression that the Iranian regime has set up and the egregious human rights abuses that it has perpetrated. I think human rights sanctions are also important because under U.S. law today, we should be sanctioning companies that are providing tools of oppression to the Iranian regime. That authority exists under Sasada. We have not sanctioned any companies for doing so. They are providing technology and parts and components for the Iranian uh, nuclear industry. So it is counterproliferation sanctions. It is human rights sanctions. We have the ability to be much more rigorous in enforcing existing law. And I think let's start with cutting the tools of oppression that are being sold to the regime, the U.S. and international companies that are sell selling multi-million dollar hardware units and software that help the regime target Iranian dissidents, roll them up, torture them, and kill them. And that would be a good place to start in expanding our view of sanctions beyond energy and economic sanctions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. With uh, concurrence from the rest of the, the, the uh, members, I think what we will do now is we will move to the, to the second panel, unless uh, members had any additional questions. We want to thank you for your, your expertise, for your participation here today. Um, we, again, if you have any additional comments you care to share with the committee, we would certainly welcome those. Thank you again. We will stand in recess for just a few minutes while we change to the second panel.
committee will come, now come back into session and come to order. Uh, we are going to move to our second panel, and uh, we are going to recognize uh, Mr. Adam Zubin, who is the Director of the Office of Foreign Asset Control at the Department of Treasury, uh, Mr. Henry Wooster, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary with the Department of State, and Mr. Colin Call is the Deputy Assistant Secretary with the Department of Defense. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If the witnesses will please uh, rise and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. And, uh, let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, in order to allow time for discussion, we would appreciate if you uh, limit your verbal testimony to five minutes, and we will certainly submit your full testimony uh, into the record. We will now start with uh, recognizing Mr. Zubin uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Treasury Department's contributions to the Obama administration's strategy to address Iran and the threat posed by Iran's nuclear program and its extensive support for terrorism. I am pleased to be here with Deputy Assistant Secretary Wooster and Deputy Assistant Secretary Call because the progress that we have made has been due to a strong interagency collaboration to confront the threats that we face from Iran, and those threats are very real. The administration is pressing Iran hard across multiple fronts. Since just the fall of last year, the Treasury Department has imposed sanctions against over 230 individuals and companies tied to Iranian human rights violations, WMD proliferation, and terrorist facilitation. And we have extended the impact of these actions with concerted outreach to our allies and the jurisdictions where Iran has operated historically. We have focused particular pressure on key actors and commercial sectors that advance Iran's illicit activities internationally and therefore represent real vulnerabilities for Iran. The IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and its expanding network of companies within and outside of Iran, those Iranian banks that have served as agents for Iran's proliferation and terrorist activities, and Iran's international transportation arms, including its national maritime carrier, ERISL, and its two largest airlines, which have facilitated the movement of weapons, funds, and personnel for the IRGC and its external operations arm, the IRGC Quds Force. Our efforts were powerfully advanced by Congress with the enactment last year of the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act, or SASADA. SASADA presented a stark choice to foreign financial institutions that were still willing to do business with designated Iranian banks or the IRGC. You can do business with these rogue actors or you can do business in the United States. You cannot do both. We have taken this message to over 45 countries now and pressed this choice with over 80 foreign financial institutions, making the successful point that these actors should have no access to the formal financial system. The message has been heard. Whereas a few years ago the United States was the only jurisdiction in the world to restrict dealings with Iranian banks, today Iran's largest banks are struggling to maintain accounts and access in any bank in any country. The European Union, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Australia, Norway, and Switzerland have all imposed sanctions with real bite against Iranian financial institutions above and beyond the four successive UN Security Council resolutions. And banks across the rest of the world have severed their ties with Iranian blacklisted entities to protect themselves and their reputations. In the meantime, we at OFAC have intensified our enforcement efforts at home to ensure that our sanctions are being fully implemented by U.S. persons and by companies doing business here. In August, OFAC concluded the largest sanctions settlement in our history with a U.S. financial institution in which J.P. Morgan Chase agreed to pay over $88 million to settle alleged violations of Iran and other OFAC sanctions programs. And increasingly, OFAC is acting in concert with other U.S. government and law enforcement agencies to penalize and deter sanctions violators. In February, we joined in a public announcement with the Justice Department, the Commerce Department, the FBI, and other agencies in the criminal indictment and designation of Milad Jafari and his network for their illegal supply of specialized metals from the United States to entities involved in Iran's ballistic missile program. In another coordinated action, we took public action with the Department of Commerce and the Justice Department against Bali Aviation and the Bali Group for its illegal export of a Boeing 747 aircraft from the U.S. to Iran and obtained a $15 million settlement with that company. 
Finally, this past month, we announced a joint civil and criminal resolution with Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security and the Justice Department against Sunrise Technologies, which had exported computer-related goods from the U.S. to Iran via Dubai. These coordinated multi-agency enforcement actions demonstrate the concerted impact that we can have when we harness our authorities across the government. Overall, our strategy is yielding significant results. Iran has never before been as isolated, and its leaders are worried. I would be glad to expand further on these impacts if the Committee so desires. But of course, there is still much to be done. We have yet to see the needed action by Iran to comply with its international obligations. In the weeks ahead, then, working with our colleagues across the Administration and with Congress, we will seek to further deepen Iran's isolation and increase the pressure on its leadership to alter their course. We thank you for your continued support in seeking to apply the most effective pressure possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wooster, you are uh, recognized for five minutes. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here to discuss the Administration's policy toward Iran and the progress we have made since January 2009. The key objectives of this Administration's Iran policy remain to prevent it from acquiring nuclear weapons, our foremost priority, from supporting terrorism, from committing human rights abuses, and from destabilizing the region. We have enacted the toughest sanctions Iran has faced. Our policy is making Iran's current course unsustainable, reducing its options, and deepening its isolation. Indeed, Iran is an outcast among nations. The U.S. Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act, SASADA as we all know it, has been vital to ratcheting up pressure on Iran. With SASADA as a tool, we have shut down important sources of funding to Iran's nuclear program and related illicit activities. Investment and technical assistance in Iran's upstream oil and gas sector have dropped dramatically. We have sanctioned 10 foreign companies involved in Iran's energy sector and dissuaded energy firms like Shell, ENI, Total, and Inpex from continuing or undertaking sanctionable activities in Iran. Major energy traders from Russia, India, Switzerland, Kuwait, Turkey, France, and the Netherlands have stopped sales of refined petroleum products to Iran. As my OFAC colleague has described, we have used executive orders to designate entities that support or facilitate terrorist or proliferation activity, including Mahan Air, Iran Air, and Tidewater Middle East Company. Last month, we designated five individuals for their involvement in Iran's plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in the United States. Others, including the European Union and Canada, have already taken or will take similar actions against these individuals. Our policies have been effective in sharpening the choices before the regime. As Iranian President Ahmadinejad recently admitted in a speech to the Majlis, the Iranian Parliament, which government can work under so much pressure? This is the heaviest economic onslaught on a nation in history. We are committed to the P5 plus 1 framework to engage with Iran, provided it is prepared to discuss seriously its nuclear program. Until then, we will work with other nations on new sanctions measures. The latest IAEA Director General's report on Iran's nuclear program deepens our concerns. And we are consulting with allies on how to respond at this week's Board of Governors meeting in Vienna. The Iranian regime's unacceptable behavior extends to its human rights abuses. In response to the regime's systematic campaign of violence and intimidation against protesters in 2009, we designated 11 individuals and three entities for egregious human rights violations and we continue to compile evidence to designate the worst abusers. For the past eight years, we have co-sponsored a U.N. resolution calling Iran to account for its human rights abuses. Last year, this resolution passed with the largest margin to date. In March, we helped create the position of the Special Rapporteur on Iran, whose recent reporting has shown a spotlight on the regime's repression of its own citizens. We also equip Iranian civil society with capacity-building programs training, media access, counter-censorship tools, and exchanges to help Iranians defend their fundamental rights and freedoms. Turning to the broader region, we acknowledge the concerns that our military withdrawal from Iraq will allow Iran to expand its influence. However, we also know most Iraqis reject Iran's interference. Iraqi leaders have rebuffed Iranian political pressure, and Prime Minister Maliki has said he will not tolerate 
the violent activities of Iran-backed militant groups. Iraq is diversifying its foreign relations and developing relationships with EU countries and regional players. In October, Iraqi Foreign Minister Zabari stressed in a press conference with his Iranian counterpart, and I quote, no other party can fill the vacuum in Iraq except the people of Iraq and the government of Iraq. We are working with Iraqi security forces to strengthen their capabilities beyond 2011, an aspect that Colin can speak to more directly. We are helping Iraq establish credible public institutions that protect its sovereignty and independence. In closing, this administration has expanded the varieties of tools and partners to deter Iran from developing nuclear weapons, continuing its human rights abuses, and destabilizing the regime, excuse me, the region. Sanctions are having an effect. With the aim of compelling the Iranian regime to change its strategic calculus, we will work with Congress and our allies to increase pressure. It is Iran's re responsibility and its self-interest to join the international community of nations. Until then, it only faces growing isolation and condemnation. Thank you once again. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wooster. We will now recognize Dr. Call for five minutes. Chairman Chaffetz, uh, Ranking Member Tierney, uh, distinguished committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Defense's uh, role in the administration's policy toward Iran. You know, as you know, the President has made Iran one of his very top uh, national security priorities. Uh, the Defense Department plays a supporting role in our whole-of-government dual-track uh, approach of engagement on the one hand and pressure on the other, which is led by uh, the State Department and the Treasury Departments. However, a supporting role for DOD should not be interpreted uh, by anyone as a minor role. Uh, in support of interagency efforts to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and to counter its destabilizing efforts and activities in the region, the Defense Department focuses on four main lines of effort. First, ensuring Israel's security. Second, building partnership capacity in the region. Third, developing a regional security architecture, especially in the Gulf. And four, prudent defense planning. Let me begin with the first one, Israel. Iran's nuclear and missile programs and its sponsorship for terrorism represent a significant threat to Israel. In the face of this threat, we, the United States, are working closely with the Israelis to develop multilayered ballistic missile defenses, and we continue our efforts to ensure Israel's qualitative military edge. The U.S.-Israel defense relationship is strong and enduring. Indeed, based on joint military exercises like Juniper Cobra and continued cooperation, both Secretaries Panetta and Secretary Gates before him have called the relationship with Israel, quote, stronger than ever. We regularly consult with Israel and maintain a close, extensive, and very frank defense dialogue. We also continue unprecedented cooperation with the Israeli Defense Forces to ensure that the qualitative military edge extends to all present and future threats. As you know, Israel is the only nation in the region that will receive fifth generation aircraft in the form of the Joint Strike Fighter. Another example is your support for President Obama's request to provide an additional $205 million to Israel for the Iron Dome short-range rocket and mortar defense system. As you are probably aware, Iron Dome has already proved effective in the field successfully striking down rockets that would have otherwise landed on Israeli civilian targets. These efforts to buttress Israel's security help underline our general message to Iran, which is pursuing nuclear weapons offers Iran no true benefits and efforts to destabilize the region through proxies and support for terrorism ultimately will not succeed. We also continue to work with our partners elsewhere in the region to build capacity to defend them against Iran's destabilizing activities. By the end of next month in Iraq, we will complete the drawdown of U.S. forces in accordance with the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement. Some have expressed concerns that we are leaving behind a vacuum for Iran to fill. However, we are not disengaging from Iraq, and there is no vacuum for Iran to fill. Due to the extraordinary sacrifices of U.S. armed forces, civilians, and Iraqis, Iraq has emerged as an increasingly stable, sovereign, and self-reliant nation. Iraq has no desire to be dominated by Iran or anyone else. Iraqi nationalism is strong, and the Iraqis have consistently shown their willingness to resist the Iranians when they have overreached. Moreover, as Iraq's economy continues to grow, particularly its oil industry, we expect that Iraqi self-confidence will grow as well. The Iraqis have also made clear that they have a strong desire for an enduring relationship and strategic partnership with the United States, including robust security cooperation, as we will pursue this partnership under the 2008 U.S.-Iraq Strategic Framework Agreement. The recent decision, for example, for the Iraqis to purchase U.S. F-16 aircraft is just one example of Iraq's interest in the long-term defense relationship with us. Iraq is now our ninth largest customer in terms of foreign military sales and the fourth largest in the region. 
continued security ties through our Office of Security Cooperation in Baghdad and security assistance activities such as foreign military sales or FMS and theater engagement activities that U.S. Central Command will engage in will deepen this partnership in the years ahead. Similarly, in Lebanon, we are working to strengthen Lebanon's national institutions and its ability to exercise its sovereignty and authority over all of its territory. Central to this work is the development of the Lebanese armed forces through our continued training, assistance, and, mil uh, assistance and military uh, efforts. Since 2008, the United States has been committed to helping the, the Lebanese armed forces effectively counter the operations of terrorists within Lebanon, secure Lebanon's borders, and work alongside the U.N. to implement all Lebanon-related U.N. Security Council resolutions. DOD is also working closely with its Gulf partners to develop a common regional security architecture, one that includes both bilateral and multilateral elements. These initiatives include a regional network of air and ballistic missile defense, shared early warning systems, counterterrorism and counterpiracy efforts, programs to build partner capacity, and projects to harden and protect our partners' critical infrastructure. We currently have substantial missile defense assets in a number of Gulf partner nations to protect U.S. forces and partners from the threat of Iranian missiles, and U.S. Central Command maintains robust theater uh, engagement and exercise schedules to buttress these partnerships. As we improve our, our bilateral and multilateral cooperation, we are also working to build the defense capabilities of our partners. Indeed, the Middle East accounts for a large portion of U.S. military worldwide FMS activity, uh, particularly with Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Israel, and Iraq. Indeed, in the past 10 years, these five countries account for more than $66 billion in active FMS cases. Lastly, let me turn to DOD planning. When it comes to Iran, we know that there are no overnight solutions, and we also know that many of our diplomatic, economic, and security cooperation efforts are just now beginning to bear fruit, as evidenced by the Iranian President Ahmadinejad's recent statements that Henry mentioned. At the same time, we know that Iran has not ceased its proliferation activities, nuclear activities, or support for terrorism. For that reason, the Department continues to prepare for all contingencies. On this point, let me be clear. It is the Department of Defense's responsibility to plan for all contingencies and to provide the President with a wide range of military options should they become necessary. That is a responsibility we take very seriously, and when it comes to the threat posed by Iran, the President has not taken any options off the table. But I also want to emphasize our continued belief that at this time, diplomacy and pressure remain the most effective tools for changing Iran's behavior. With that, uh, I thank you once again, and I look forward to answering your questions. And thank you. I know this is a, a, a very complicated and deep uh, subject, so to try to summarize in five minutes is, is difficult, and, but we do appreciate it. I now like to recognize myself for five minutes. And, and Mr. Zubin, um, you are the Director of the Office of Foreign Assets Control, um, OFAC, as it is often referred to. How many people do you have in your group or your department? About 165. And how many of them actually work on this particular issue? Iran has been the number one priority for us. It is difficult for me to give you a FTE number because we divide up our functions by the, the operations. So we have licensing officers, enforcement officers, people who prepare the designations. If you had to guess, how many people would you guess are actually working on this? It, it would be hard to put a number on it. I, I can go back and try to come back right. to you with an estimate. But it, it is our number one priority and has been for as long as I have been at OFAC, which is five years. Um, according to Mr. Dubowitz, who testified in the panel just before us, China is the largest importer of Iranian oil behind the European Union. Companies owned by the Chinese government are also suppliers of illicit materials in support of Iran's nuclear weapons program. Is the United States enforcing sanctions against the Chinese government or any Chinese entity? Absolutely. And uh, I will I'll defer in a moment to Mr. Wooster, who can speak to the State Department sanctions. But we at Treasury have imposed sanctions against Chinese companies, including some state owned firms, that were providing uh, parts and equipment to Iranian, Iran's missile procurement efforts. And how many companies are you investigating at the current time? What does the universe of that look like? Chinese companies? Mm -hmm. I am not at liberty to disclose that. How, um, back in, uh, let me go to another part here. Um, following the, uh, the exposure of the Iranian plot to potentially uh, assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States, the Obama administration actually floated the idea of uh, sanctioning the Iranian Central Bank. In fact, 92 United States senators out of 100 signed a letter. Uh, suggesting in support of that. Um, where is that in its progress? What would be the effect of that? Is that something that the Obama administration has abandoned? 
Uh, as Under Secretary Cohen has, has mentioned, including in testimony recently, the plan has that, that proposal or idea has not been abandoned. It is very much on the table, as are all options that we could take that would credibly and meaningfully impact Iran and well, why not do its it? efforts. I mean, why not do it? The, the issues are, are several. We need to analyze any prospective option in terms of the evidence that is available to us, of course, the impact that it would have on Iran, and the impact that well, we would have want to have on the maximum effect on Iran, right? So are we exactly. just trying to place, I mean, is there a spectrum here that says, well, we don't want to be too hard? No, no, no. The, the, okay, so, uh, the, the so why is, is that? Why, I mean, you listed that as your second consideration. Why, why, well, why? I think it needs to be measured against my third consideration, which is what would the impact be on the United States and our allies and other countries around the world? If we are considering an action so that would have So give me an example light, of how that would impact exactly, the United States. I am happy to. If, if we are considering an option that would have a low to moderate impact on Iran and would have a serious negative impact on the U.S. or our allies, then that is a, a way. What, what would be the serious, can you give me a, an example of where that would be a serious impact to the United States? I am happy to. And uh, I would just apologize in advance. I am not an e economic analyst, and so my um, familiarity with economic modeling may not be uh, up to your satisfaction. But in the oil discussion uh, in particular, there are very real scenarios in which an oil price spike might hit that could result in a somewhat of a decrease. So we're not willing. We're, it, this is what it's mystifying. It came out in the first panel too. But this is the this is the concern that you're somehow gauging the Treasury Department is somehow gauging the price of oil, and I'm trying to figure out what price per gallon are we not willing to pay? I mean, why is the price of a gallon of gas the primary driver in our in the Obama administration's quest to supposedly make sure that they don't get an, a nuclear bomb, for goodness sake. Why is the price of gas one of those, right, I mean, twice, you've listed off, right near the top of the list? Is that really the concern? The, the, the price of, of oil is not the primary driver. It is certainly a consideration because it is a primary driver of the recovery that is going on worldwide and the strength of our economy and that of many of our allies. When will you but make I, a decision about whether or not to pursue this uh, Iranian central bank sanction? What is what, what, the timeline here? When are we going to have a decision? I, I can't answer that. Why, why not? Who makes that decision? The decision we made by uh, the administration as a whole. But I do want to challenge the notion that it is a question of how much of a price uptick are we willing to take on ourselves in exchange for a profound impact on Iran. If there is a hike in the price of oil, Iran gains. If there is a, a spike in the price of oil, Iran could be facing a windfall. And so there are scenarios in which, and there are plausible scenarios, in which there could be profound harm to the global economic recovery and a windfall to Iran. I don't think that's what any of us are looking for. So I find it's an area where we need to proceed. I think with great my, my time is uh, my time is expired. We need to get to the other members. But the fact that you have 92 United States senators in a very bipartisan way suggests, and this something an idea that was floated out there by the Obama administration, and now we're pulling back on it is is really quite stunning. Uh, I'll yield now five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Zubin. I didn't hear you say that you were pulling back on it. Are you pulling back on it? No. As I said, that's the I, option remains on the table. Yeah, that's what I thought I heard you say. Uh, and I, I suspect you are considering whether or not doing it would have an adverse effect of causing Iran to get enriched by that action, therefore totally disregarding any effect on it and, and making it useless to, in effect. That is correct. And, and uh, potentially worse than useless, potentially resulting in a, a boon to Iran. Emboldening them even more. On that. So that would seem to be a useful thing to consider before you went and did that. You know, but others might feel differently on that. So, so it seems to be that the people that want to be critical, first on the one hand, say what a great job this administration has done uh, on sanctions and internationalizing them and having it move forward, and then they qualify that by saying in the medium and the long range, but they don't think it's going to be immediate enough to actually reach the goal, which is to somehow impede the development of, of nuclear capacity on that. So are we doing all that, we, all that should be done? to impede that in time so that one doesn't all strip the other? And what else ought we be doing? I want to ask each of you that. Well, first, I, I do think that experts across the spectrum have acknowledged that the pressure on Iran, especially in recent months, has grown to an unprecedented level. Iran is more isolated than ever, 
financially, in terms of trade, in terms of investment in its oil sector, and politically. And uh, the IAEA Board of Governors report and the revelation of the Arbab Siar plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. have greatly compounded Iran's isolation and its problems. I, in, in terms of are we doing everything, we are certainly trying. This is my number one priority, and we are trying to identify every possible option we can take, whether it is a U.S. unilateral action in the form of a, an OFAC or a State Department designation, whether it is a multilateral concerted effort we can take with allies, or whether it is action in New York uh, pursuant to a U.N. Security Council resolution. We are trying to identify every possible lever that we can push that would exert additional impact, and I commit to you that we will continue to be relentless about that. Thank you. Mr. Wooster. Congressman Tierney, uh, in response to your question about what we are doing, as Adam has rightly said, this, uh, I, it certainly occupies uh, the bulk of my life and that of my team. And we have 39 people uh, in the Office of Iranian Affairs, 17 of them overseas, 22 uh, domestically. Um, we are engaged on this n all the time. Uh, we are engaged on it in Washington. We are engaged on it in terms of contributions that uh, reporting officers are making in the field, well beyond the ones I named in terms of the office's own assets. Uh, this is a whole-of-government approach, I believe, Under Secretary Sherman has been emphatic in uh, declaring that as aspect of it. Uh, yesterday, I know Adam and I spent uh, probably more time with, than we would care to with one another uh, at the White House uh, going over the particular details of this issue. Uh, with a host of other actors as well. On the diplomatic front in terms of the Department of State, what we keep a particularly close eye on, of course, are, is the, uh, the point where we can obtain optimal leverage, maximum leverage. And at the same time, we are not alienating key people that we need to work with in a coalition. It's where these are stronger, they are more effective. Um, they are more fearful, even if it is just the optics uh, of it as well. And in, in, and in actuality, the bite is much deeper when we have a united front, when we have a coalition. To date, we can report success, notwithstanding uh, the points that um, uh, Representative Chaffetz has mentioned in terms of China. I know this is a continuing concern with the Congress. Uh, there just aren't easy responses to that. But nonetheless, we have six U.N. Security Council resolutions where they, too, have put ink on the paper. They, too, have assented um, to this. And they agree on the fundamentals, as do the Russians, uh, that the idea of this regime having a nuclear weapon is not a good one. We have had people make the argument to us that, um, that at some point you could take an action uh, that, in fact, would go beyond hurting the, uh, the, the Guard, uh, the Quds Force, the regime and hurt the Iranian people to make their lives so miserable that at some point uh, they start to support a government that they, now many of them might be inclined to resist. Uh, is there such a tipping point in your view, is, and do you take that into account in your, in your calculations? Yes, sir. Uh, in terms of a tipping point, I, I can't offer you an exact point on the curve where that is located, but there is. I mean, we have witnessed most particularly around the issue of the nuclear question uh, a lot of this data is available through, in fact, the overwhelming amount of it is available through public polling, uh, Iranian polling, third government polling, academic institutions, think tanks, and, of course, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, resources that each government has, uh, particularly our allies. But it comes up resoundingly with uh, the, the conclusion that um, the nuclear issue um, is very much one of those events. There is a lot of nationalism behind the notion uh, of a nuclear Iran. Uh, there, uh, of course, are deleterious effects uh, as well. Um, but the fact is that a good number of Iranians are very much united around the issue of their country, too, being a member of the, if you will, nuclear club. So um, it is something that we keep an eye on. Uh, our, as I mentioned at the outset of my remarks, the paramount objective for us is ensuring that the regime does not obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, between that point, the apex, if you will, uh, and uh, the area below it, there is considerable room for maneuver. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are welcome. Now I recognize uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Call, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency report that just came out, obviously quite sobering, but not a surprise to anyone, 
Um, we've been at this a little while now. The window to do something seems to be narrowing. Um, what is the plan? I mean, it seems tough to say here, but it seems almost inevitable. Um, what is the plan? What do we do if we have a nuclear Iran? First of all, uh, it's obviously our policy to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, the administration sees that uh, the, the acquisition of a nuclear weapon is as unacceptable. Um, you know, how much time we have, I think there's, there's uh, some debate in that. We, obviously, the IAEA uh, report is troubling. I think that, though, that there is, uh, is still time uh, to keep on the path that we're on now, which is to turn up the heat uh, diplomatically and through economic uh, pressure. Meanwhile, ensuring that, that the President has all options available uh, to him so that when he says all options are on the table, those options are viable. So the Defense Department's uh, activities currently are oriented in the region uh, to convey to Iran uh, our resolve uh, to counter their destabilizing activities in their aggression, uh, to defend our, our partners and to deny them the benefits of their nuclear and, ballis and uh, ballistic missile uh, program through our, through our defense activities. Um, but it, I think it is our view that we still have some time and that any discussion of military action or something else has to be viewed very much as a, as a last resort given the highly uncertain uh, consequences that ad, that action would have. Uh, I get it, but I have only been here a short time now. I am in my second term. But um, I feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, right? I mean, I have been at this meeting before. And we could save the tapes and no disrespect, we could have this meeting again next year and we could be talking. Last year, I believe, we are talking about years. Now we are talking about a year from a very credible agency. Uh, and what we have also seen is that the window tends to, every time we hear something else, the window is narrower. This is exponential growth. It is uh, it's very scary. So this last year went by very quickly since we had a significant discussion about that. So I, I get it. And I voted for sanctions and I'm up for all options. But uh, you know, I'm not sure we're pointing to Monty Hall is pointing to door number two or door number three at some point in time. You know, are, are we ready facing what is wh whether there's a debate or not, very credible agency is less than a year now. We have our allies, um, we have our troops. We have uh, destabilization. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu talked about exporting a uh, very strong threat. So it, beyond all that, I know you don't want to talk about it, but is there a plan? Are we ready? So I think we need to treat all these timelines uh, with, with um, kind of an, put an appropriate context around them. So when you hear, have groups estimating one year, two years till they could have uh, a testable nuclear device, the important caveat in that is from a decision by the Iranian government to, to dash for a nuclear device. Uh, there is no evidence that that decision has been made. So that one year, in a sense, is sliding. So part of the reason why you have this Groundhog Day is, you know, a couple of years ago you might have uh, heard a similar estimate, but that was also based on the notion that the Iranians hadn't made a decision. So what's clear is what the Iranians are doing is trying to put themselves into a position in which the supreme leader can make a decision. And we do have to be worried that when and if that decision is ever, ever made, the time to actually c complete a uh, testable device could shrink over time. So we're, we're, we're watching that. Uh, very, very, very carefully. But I think we still do uh, have some time. Um, but it is the responsibility of our department uh, to do prudent planning to ensure uh, that all options are available when and if uh, we detect that uh, Iran has made the decision uh, to do this. That is as good as it gets, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wooster, I am wondering, can you describe what the competing arguments are within Iran as you see it uh, on this question of proceeding aggressively towards the development of a nuclear weapon? Um, I can comment, if you will, or make some observations about the national level discussion. 
Is, is that what you mean? Right. And I am assuming there is some internal debate that there are forces that are arguing for an aggressive approach. There are probably some uh, forces that are arguing uh, against that. I am mean, wondering about the, the, your Department's assessment of what those arguments internally within Iran are, who is making them and who is prevailing. Thank you. Well, the, um, the, the party lines, if you will, are, are drawn fairly clearly. They have been for some time. Some of the names and personalities have changed. But there remains a, uh, a hardcore sort of inner circle um, who are keen to uh, develop a nuclear program uh, that has been demonstrated for years. The IAEA report demonstrates also what the United States has known for a long time, that Iran had a nuclear weapons program. Um, we have continuing concerns about that. Uh, that is emphatically clear to all of you, as uh, one of your colleagues mentioned. Right. This is, uh, you know, we have all seen that before. In terms of uh, the debate within the country, a good number, remember the, the, the astonishing, one of the astonishing facts about Iran is that we have a, an extraordinary demographic, uh, 70, 75 million people. 70 percent of whom are 30-something or under. It's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's really extraordinary. So you've got a lot of folks who look toward the future and who think about what their prospects are. And when they do, the notion of living in a pariah state where options are foreclosed to them in terms of business, travel, education, uh, that's, that's not a, a heartening prospect for them. And they've demonstrated that. Those folks obviously are keen, notwithstanding whatever sympathy they may have, to see their nation, if you will, belly up to the bar with other nuclear powers to be recognized as uh, a great country or a great power. Nonetheless, they haven't demonstrated that element that I'm speaking of, hegemonic tendencies. Uh, they are, wouldn't fit into the camp of what we would call those with um, desires for destabilizing regional influences. Uh, many of them are keen on rapport with the West, uh, particularly with the United States. Uh, but, and this is a big but, they don't hold the power. So the folks who have the power, the predominant power, this is, uh, again, you are familiar with a host of characters, the Supreme Leader, the IRGC, its constituent elements, such as the Quds Force, uh, and various other uh, uh, deeply conservative political figures. But again, beyond that circle, and that is a relatively small circle, but it is a very powerful circle, there is room for maneuver. That being what? I am sorry? What would that room for maneuver be? And then Dr. Kyle can uh, uh, comment on that as well. Yeah. We uh, find that the Iranians remain extraordinarily interested in the United States. It is the aspiration of a good number of Iranians. Uh, the older Iranians to send their children here to be educated, to visit, to travel, to have the opportunity to uh, um, enjoy aspects of American culture and education that they knew in another era. Uh, that is not an option. They let's, let's show up just, and I am going to be out of time, and I would just like to hear a little bit from Dr. Kali. I hate certainly. to interrupt you, but it is a time issue. No, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, I think in general, uh, again, our, 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 our role is to try to convince the Iranian leadership that they will be less, less safe, not more, uh, if they uh, keep going on, on this nuclear weapons uh, path. Uh, so we are doing that, again, by trying to deny them the benefits of those activities through our security cooperation uh, relationships in the Gulf, our ballistic mis missile defense uh, architecture, uh, our efforts to build up their capabilities, our efforts to, uh, to uh, uh, work with Israel uh, on their defenses and, pro and provide for their qualitative military edge. So all of that is oriented, again, against uh, uh, about sending the Iranians a very clear signal that not only are they facing increasing diplomatic and financial isolation, mm -hmm. but they are aligning the rest of the region against them in a way that is going to make them profoundly unsecure. And so this is trying to create an incentive structure that leaves them to one conclusion, which is they st should stop doing this. Uh, and so that is our number one uh, objective. I would just say on the young, on the, on the young people of, of, uh, in Iran, you know, there is a lot of evidence that they think, in, uh, many of them think very favorably of the United States. So I think we need to be careful in a lot of what we do uh, to make sure that we are you know, not alienating a group of individuals that, that we, we, want to, uh, we want to work with and have a relationship with uh, over, over the long term, as, as long as they can stop being held hostage by their government. Thank you very much. Yield back. 
Thank you. And I'll recognize myself for an additional five minutes. Um, Mr. Rooster, I want to make sure I heard you, heard you properly. When talking about the IAEA report, you said that uh, Iran had a nuclear program. They, they currently have one, though. Is that correct? They have had sir, one and they have one. Sir, it was that they had a nuclear weapons program, not a nuclear program, but a nuclear weapons program. And do you believe that they have one now? They have provided no assurance that they have abandoned the pursuit of do a nuclear weapon. Do you believe? Weapon. What do you? I am asking. What, I, do you believe the report that was just issued or not? Sir, the administration's position is and has been for years reflected in what you see in the report. The report remains a restricted document, although I am aware that it has been leaked to folks and it is available on the Internet. Uh, the limits, because we are having a conversation about these issues with ministers today, excuse me, Thursday and Friday in Vienna, there are limits on what I can say in this setting. I can't offer my personal opinion. I am trying to get, I am sorry, I wasn't trying to get your personal opinion. I, I want to get, understand the administration's opinion as to whether or not they believe that they have a nuclear weapons program. No or yes? We remain concerned that the, that the Iranian regime has obfuscated on precisely this issue. We don't have transparency. We want to know, we want certainty that they do not have a weapons program. That is what we are seeking. Um, Mr. Dubowitz uh, listed 18 firms. I will come back to Mr. Uh, uh, Zubin here. Mr. Dubowitz uh, listed 18 firms connected to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, IRGC, in which form part of the uh, crude oil supply chain. These firms' activities were detailed in a report from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies to the administration in, in February. So I want to come back to this issue and say, where are you at in sanctioning these particular 18, and are you, you know, what, what's happening with this report? This has been since February. And, and we have that report, and we have had our analysts take a very careful look at it. As you have seen, if, if you have uh, been following the releases from, from our department, we have made sanctions against the IRGC and its entities uh, the key plank in our Iran strategy on the reasoning that the IRGC is one of the most culpable actors for supporting terrorism, supporting WMD development, and including repression, including in Syria, but also on the reasoning that IRGC is becoming increasingly unpopular in Iran. And so it plays into this domestic discontent, which I think is going to be key if these sanctions do have uh, the impact we are looking for. We have announced sanctions against lots of IRGC fronts, including their largest port operator uh, and a whole host of companies. And we have also designated companies in Iran's oil infrastructure. And we have been able to get the United Nations as well to, to act in this, in this area by uh, restricting uh, petroleum imports into Iran. Well, what about these particular 18? On these particular 18, I, I can't comment on uh, which we are poised to designate. We don't comment on upcoming designations. But I can say that uh, to designate any and all IRGC companies is very much consistent with what has been our strategy. I guess the concern is you have had this report since February, and I just would appreciate an update as there one becomes one that is more publicly available. Um, let me go back to you again, Mr. Zubin, here. Is the administration prepared to sanction Chinese firms like, I am going to pr pronounce this improperly, Zuhai Zenrong, a subsidiary of Norinco? Norinco? which is openly flouting uh, the sanctions at this time? Are you familiar with this organization? I am sorry, my pronunciation is terrible. But. I, I believe that is uh, an energy firm, is that yes, right? Yes, correct. Okay, so I, I would defer to my colleague from the State Department uh, who administers the energy sanctions. Mr. Wooster, do you, are you familiar with this firm and where we are at on this? I am not so familiar with the particulars of the firm. I am familiar with the uh, concerns about China and the energy sector. Primarily, our concern there is that the, because the Chinese have, in fact, um, been pulling back in this area and because we have engaged at the highest levels, the President has engaged, the Secretary of State and others, we have also wanted them not to, in particular, backfill behind any other energy firms that have left. And to date, and to date we can report that what we are seeing is satisfactory. We continue to keep an eye on it. We continue to discuss it. It was discussed in Beijing uh, less than a week ago uh, with Deputy Secretary of State Burns. And we, we continue to keep a close eye on this.
Um, and, and last uh, uh, last point I'd like to make here before we wrap up, Mr. Wooster, uh, there's deep concern about uh, our presence in Iraq after the 31st of December uh, with the Department of Defense pulling out uh, 16,500 people there uh, uh, under the control of Secretary Clinton. Um, are, how prepared are we for what uh, may or may not happen come January 1st? Sir, I would have limited uh, capability to give you a good response about the management particulars of the Department in terms of its Iraq particular preparations. However, uh, what I can say from the policy perspective is that we are committed to a long-term relationship with Iraq. No one should doubt the U.S. Government's commitment to that country. We have a transition now in our relationship with Iraq. It is tempting to see it as a, uh, is going from black to white, but in fact it is not. It is a transition. We are moving from one phase in our relationship to another phase in that relationship. Again, our commitment to the region and to Iraq is longstanding and it endures. Thank you. I, I, um, I appreciate you all being here for your testimony here today uh, and the, the work that you do on behalf of our country. Again, we appreciate your presence and the committee now stands adjourned.